Good morning, everyone. Great to see you all. We're in the second week of this new series called Loving You is Hard. Uh, of course, I don't, I don't mean you. Loving you is not hard, except for Chuck. But loving you is, is easy. But um, we all have people in our lives that are hard to love. And some of them kind of can be as serious as what we would call enemies. Uh, we talked about that last week. How do you love your enemies? How do you love those who abuse you, mistreat you, insult you, those who curse you? Like, how do we respond to that? Last week, we learned that Jesus says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to love just like I do. So you love indiscriminately, meaning you don't pick and choose who you love. Uh, the other deal was, he says, that you love uh, kind of undeservedly. In other words, you love people that don't really deserve your love because of maybe what they've done to you or said to you or acted towards you, but that's not the way God loves. God loves everybody, even those who nailed him to a cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. So last week, we kind of intro the series with some pretty tough examples of loving those who are against us. Now, we're kind of at the tail end of our ministry year. In this last year, we've been focusing on living a life of love. That's kind of was our goal or our emphasis for the year, living a life of love. At the beginning of the year, we primarily focused on loving the lovely. You know, being better at loving those whom we really love and who, who love us. But this, uh, at the end of this year, we're trying to punctuate the goal with loving the unlovely, loving the difficult, loving the hard. And so that's really where we are. If you weren't with us last week, we kicked off that series. This is week two, and we need to ask God to help us. Let's pray. Father, as we begin uh, our study of your word, we again ask you, Holy Spirit, just to speak to us. Give us understanding of what you have to say to us today. Give us courage, a God, to uh, apply it. And Father, we just acknowledge before you that we live in a world of difficult people. Um, people that we find who are opposed to us. People who, uh, um, Lord, for various reasons, just act in ways that make them difficult to love. And yet, God, we think about you and how you loved everyone. Those that you weren't expected to love, the tax collectors and sinners. Uh, Lord, uh, those who, uh, even uh, later as the Apostle Paul tells us, those, uh, Lord, who were indifferent toward you, uh, Lord, who were still sinners, even then you, you died for them. And Lord, would you just um, continue to focus us on the incredible way that you love. And then just capture our attention with this idea that you call us to love like you. So, Lord, with all that in mind, we just entrust our time to you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so this morning, what we're going to do is talk about loving difficult people. Do you have any difficult people in your life, what we might call prickly uh, people? Uh, maybe you have someone like this at work. It's a great little cartoon for you. I don't like to be difficult, she says, but it's the only thing I'm really good at. <laughs> have anybody like that? You think, man, that's their only really skill they bring to this company, they bring to this church, or bring to our family. Difficult. But, of course, this uh, character, God bless her, she wants to be better. So next cartoon, she says to her coworker, I've seen the error of my ways, and I've decided to start being more respectful to my coworkers. Hey, Bozo, I'm talking to you. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was actually funnier than you did. <laughs> but um, so difficult people. And even though when you try not to be difficult, you just kind of, you, you're, just, you're just difficult. So anyway, we're going to talk about that. What I mean by difficult people are people that who are kind of whiners. You know, they're complainers. They're like always critical. Like they're kind of, you know, more than just pessimist in, in personality, but just in practice. They're the, kind of the Eeyores. Uh, they're the ones that are kind of downers and drainers. Uh, these are the people that just can be just kind of difficult in the sense of, of not being team players. They're kind of rogue. They got to do everything their own way. And they just kind of make life a little bit difficult, okay? And so how do you love people like that? And that's really the job in front of us. So what we're going to do is actually look at just a few verses. I'm going to direct your attention to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, great little uh, letter from Paul to the uh, uh, Thessalonian believers and toward the end of the book. 
in chapter 5, he's going to kind of give just a lot of wisdom on a number of different topics. He uh, uh, will talk about honoring, uh, you know, those elders and leaders uh, among you who teach the word. And then he moves directly from that in verse 13. He kind of finishes and to esteem them very highly, if you're with me, chapter 5, verse 13, very highly in love because of their work. And then, then he says this, be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, and be patient with them all. Now, that's all we're going to look at today. And you may think, well, that's not very long. I can assure you there is a lot here for us to try to digest. And there are difficult people around. And Paul names kind of three different groups that I think a lot of difficult people will fall kind of within, and uh, if not all. So uh, Paul's got some wisdom here for us, and so we're, that's what we're going to look at. We're going to jump in here in more detail. If you're following along on your outline, that may help you. The first thing that you see here is that we learn that difficult people risk peace. Difficult people threaten peace. They risk peace. Like for all of us who may be difficult, that really does create problems amidst uh, the, uh, whatever group of people they find themselves. So the passage really begins with that phrase, be uh, at peace among yourselves. Well, when you think about like, okay, what do I do with this verse? Well, one thing you might say is that each one of us need to resist the idea of being a difficult person. Um, like, hey, maybe we should look at ourselves first. So like, let's all make sure that we're resisting, that we're growing, that we're maturing past being a difficult person ourselves. So there are so many different kind of things that we could look at at this point that we don't have time. Let me just kind of run through a couple of things very quickly. For example, what are difficult people? What do we need to avoid? What do we need to make sure we're not being characterized by? Well, in Philippians 2, Paul says, in humility... Count others more significant than yourselves. Do not look to your own interests only, but to the interest of others. Now, you know, a lot of difficult people don't really do that. They're looking primarily at themselves. They're primarily interested in their own interest. They're not really considering you. They can be pretty self-absorbed, can't they? Or perhaps... We can be pretty self-absorbed. So one of the things that you learn is that when, when people are going to work together and, and be like-minded, which Paul's talking about, being of the same love, of the same mind, there in Philippians chapter 2, he says, it takes everybody thinking about others and giving preference to others. Okay, like life isn't about me. Okay, not everything needs to revolve around me and my preferences. Later, he goes on and he says in verse 14, do all things without grumbling or disputing. Now, man, don't you wish you could rip that out of the Bible? I mean, what do we do like when we're standing around and we have to talk about something, you're in line, you say, man, can you believe this weather? Oh my goodness. Another three, you know, triple degree weather. And I mean, we, we typically default you know, toward, you know, being critical or complaining. And uh, that makes for a, just a difficult environment. So you, we don't want to be that. We want to resist being that kind of person. Let me give you one more. In Galatians, we get uh, a, a great tidbit of wisdom. In chapter uh, uh, 6, what we're told is that we should bear one another's burdens. And uh, that speaks to the way the body of Christ works to help each other out talks about that. And the word burden there means a really heavy, heavy load that no one can really quite manage by themselves. But then just a few verses later, he ends with saying this, that each will have to bear his own load. And the word load there is more of a reasonable amount of weight. And so he's talking about like every one of us needs to kind of learn how to pull our own weight. You know, we can't always be dependent on each other. And so maybe you've been around those who like can't really do anything for themselves and they expect you to do it all. And, and that can be kind of a difficult person. But, but we want to avoid kind of being people like that. So there's, of course, all kinds of things we could add to this list. But the first thing when it comes to the reality that difficult people risk peace, let's make sure we're not the difficult person. The second thing, though, is that we've got to learn to respond to difficult people because what love does is it doesn't avoid difficult people. That's what I would typically want to do. 
Hey, let's cross the street. Let's walk around. Let's move. Hey, but he doesn't avoid. He doesn't, uh, but actually moves toward in love. Because one of the things that you have to admit, and you will, I promise, by the end of six weeks on this series, is that God loves in such radical, unpredictable, surprising kind of ways. And that he's asking us to do the same thing. That you are to be representatives on planet Earth of the way that God loves. You're to make visible his invisible love for us. You're to be the object lessons. If people want to know, well, what kind of, well, how does God love people? They should be able to look at your life and see that. Of course, we need the Holy Spirit who helps us to live that kind of way. So we've got to learn how to, to respond to uh, difficult people. And as we move back into the text, what we find is that he's going to start giving us some, some insight in, into how to do that, what to do. So the next big point is this, is that loving difficult people uh, needs uh, kind of what I'm calling personalized responses. Personalized responses. In other words, depending on who the person is and kind of what their, quote, difficulty is, like how you respond to them needs discernment. You can't just respond the same way to every person. Someone once said that if the hammer is the, your only relational tool in your tool belt, then you see everybody as a nail. There's some real wisdom to that. <laughs> you see everybody as a nail. Okay, I've only got one relational tool, and it's a hammer. Well, what Paul's going to say is that, hey, there are different people who, whose kind of issues create some difficulty, and the person who is wanting to love like Jesus is going to discern how to respond. So uh, let's, let's do this. Let's, let's build a chart. Okay, so here, here we have three types of people. There are three types of people, and I want to take some time to try to help you understand these people are. Like the passage says, and we urge you, which is a strong word. Okay, this is not a suggestion. This is not, hey, hey, if you think about it. He says, look, I urge you, I strongly exhort you uh, to, you know, learn to relate to these people. So first of all, he describes the idol. Um, and we urge you, brothers, to admonish the idol. Now, who are the idol? Okay, the idol are... Um, those, it was uh, actually a word used as a military term for someone who couldn't really march in line. Okay, so it wasn't someone that lacked the coordination or something, but someone who just kind of didn't want to fit in. Uh, this was someone that we would say is not a very good team player. This is someone who kind of wants to just go their own way and not really kind of, you know, uh, fit in. Uh, this is somebody who... Uh, as an idle person, is, is uh, haughty, arrogant. Uh, the idea of, um, I, I don't, you know, kind of what I want to do and when I want to do it, that's the most important thing and everybody needs to kind of fit and conform around what, what I want to do. Uh, the idol was basically uh, used in sense of uh, disorderly. Uh, it was someone who, uh, didn't fit in. And so uh, that idea of, of not fitting in or being disorderly came to be used in a, in a variety of different ways. Uh, they were neglecting their responsibilities. Uh, that was one of the things that Paul especially is addressing those, if you're familiar with 1 Thessalonians, he spends two chapters on the coming of the Lord. And there were those who thought, well, the Lord's going to come back at any moment, so I'm just going to quit my job and just hang around and wait for the Lord. And uh, those who did so were doing nothing but causing problems, busybodies, gossips. He says, look, don't neglect. Like, be, uh, be uh, fitting in and conforming. So that's, that's the idol. I think the word irresponsible really captures this idea. It's someone who's irresponsible, someone who's haughty. Okay, the second uh, group, as you see in the text here, is he says, admonish the idol. And then he says, uh, encourage the faint-hearted. Now, this person is, um, you know, it's more of an emotional, not a volitional, the idol with someone who was just choosing to be difficult. This is one who's just emotionally kind of spent. And so they're overcome with worry, with sadness. Uh, they're overcome with kind of despair. 
I think hopeless kind of fits this idea. For example, the word was used in a secular setting where someone is writing to their landlord, do not lose heart about the rent. I will pay it in full. In other words, it's the idea that someone's giving up. Uh, that it has that idea. Someone who seems inconsolable. Uh, and, and so that it's, it's that, that deal. It's, it's a word that's really only used here in, in this particular form. It's a compound word, and it's made up of two words that actually means little soul. Like you, you, you know, this is a person whose capacity for life, a capacity for just emotional aliveness is just diminished. That's the faint-hearted. Could be broken by circumstances, broken by relational strife. Uh, just any knocks that life brings. They just get to the point where they can't really stand against the string. So that's the second group of people, uh, the, the faint-hearted. And then he says, help the weak. Okay, well, the weak. This is a word um, that uh, basically has the idea of uh, almost helpless. Okay, so they maybe want to do right, but they just can't bring themselves to do it. Uh, maybe they feel completely addicted or maybe they feel uh, overwhelmed, but uh, it was a word that was all, most often used as being sick, uh, being ill, uh, physically weak, but then it came to be used more generally about being weak in any particular way, emotionally, spiritually. I'm just at a place where I'm out of resources. I'm, I'm, I'm physically incapable of doing what's right. And so sometimes th these people, like they, you know, whatever it is, like they're being responsible, like they, they can't really do that. They just don't have the ability. It's not that they're choosing not to, like the idol, they just choose not to. This is the one who just says, man, I just can't bring myself to do it. Uh, some of us have tasted uh, depression. Or you know people have tasted depression and in its, in its really extreme forms. You know, you just, you just can't get out of bed. Uh, there are things that get us, you know, that create issues where we're just, we're, we're this person, we're, we're, we're the weak. Um, incapable, uh, helpless, weak. Okay, if those are the three different types of people, Paul tells us, well, how do, you, how do you treat them? How do you relate to them? How do you respond to them? So we want to take the same amount of time to look at these words. He says, well, how do you relate to the idol? He says, admonish them. The word admonish was kind of a hard word. It was uh, used uh, to, um, you know, to exhort, but really had the idea of correction. It really kind of had the idea of a hard word of warning. You know, it's, it's the idea that you're being pretty direct with somebody. And he says, with those who, the, the, you know, this, these defiant, unwilling to, like, kind of, you know, be responsible, carry their weight, uh, to those that there is an appropriate time where you're going to say something more hard, you're going to challenge them. And I wonder if your understanding of the word love includes that. Because if you think of love as only being feeling warm and fuzzy toward the person or doing for them, never really kind of challenging them, if that's your understanding of love, what you're going to see here is that God's understanding of love is much broader than that. That there is a place where love will say something hard. Now, uh, let me just kind of add a parenthesis here that you can say something kind of hard and it can be either right or wrong. You can say it out of a motive that is, has them in mind because love is always other-centered. So I don't say something hard because, hey, you're making me, you know, you're harassing me. I'm tired of putting up with you, so I'm going to lay into you. That's not what this is. This is the idea that because I love you, and because what, the way you're experiencing life right now is not for your good. It's not going to lead to life. Like, I'm going to say something 
try to help you engage with truth, I'm going to try to challenge you, okay? So there, that's, that's the idea of admonishment. It's, it can be a strong word of correction, a strong word of warning. So he says, admonish the idol that seems to fit that difficult people group called the idol. Then he says to the faint-hearted, what do you do? It says, encourage the faint-hearted. Uh, some of you know this word. It was much more of an emotional, more, more, more sensitive. It was a softer word, a more sensitive word of encouragement. It's, it's less kind of corrective and more of, of like trying to come a, 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 alongside of them. Um, you know, encourage to put courage in. I, I'm going to use words and actions that, to try to help you get in touch with the right desire, get in touch with the right kind of faith to overcome your, you know, hopelessness. So I'm, I'm sympathetic toward you or empathetic. Like I, I'm going to be your friend here like, I, want, I care about how you feel. So it's that idea of, of uh, responding um, to, to the hopeless. It's encouragement. It's a soft word. And then for the last one, the weak, he says, uh, encourage the faint-hearted. Help the weak. Now, help here it could be physical. It could be emotional. It could be whatever way that you can. I think it has the idea of assistance. You know, that there is with uh, this person at least a season of time where they just need someone to really help them get on their feet. Uh, They are, this is someone who, because of their inability, they need a supportive work, you know. And so whether they're overcoming, you know, surgery or they're overcoming a breakup or they're overcoming whatever, but that has just kind of paralyzed them in life. And so you're, like, in love, going to be willing to do some supportive work with them. You're helping the weak. But I don't treat the weak like I treat the idle. And I don't treat the faint-hearted like I treat the, the weak. Like, that's what I mean by everyone needs a personalized uh, response. Difficult people need personalized uh, responses. So, not everybody is a nail, so you've got to have more tools than a hammer. All right, now, as we think about this, you might ask yourself, well, why, why is it so difficult to love people like this? And so it, when, when you look at the passage, the last phrase in our, in our passage here, he says, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all, which is really a lot, a lot of wisdom, where God, through the apostle Paul, says, look, as you try to love the idle and the faint-hearted and the weak, like as you try to like, you know, do this, like, there, you're going to feel some tension. And not everything gets resolved really quick. You think, man, you know what? I, I really gave a good word to her last night. You know, everything ought to be fine. And you think, oh, no, no. Like, this is, there, there's, some time, there's a time element involved in most cases. And so that we have to be patient. This word patient means long-suffering. All right? It, it's the idea of long fuse. Like, I'm, gonna, I, I'm able to invest time in this. And Paul says that, and one of the reasons I think he does is because he recognizes that this is hard for us. Let me just suggest why, what the tension is that we may feel as we interact with difficult people. For example, when we think about tension, loving the idol, like, this often feels like loving the disliked. Like, if you ask me to be honest, I'm saying, I don't like this person. This person gets under my nerves, man. And so, like, you're feeling like, okay, I'm called to love them, him or her, but I just feel either disrespect toward them or I don't really like them. And the tension is that God's calling me to be other-centered, to think about their welfare, their good. And we feel that tension because, you know, to be honest with you, I'd rather just avoid them. You know, if I don't have to, I'm not going to interact with them at all. If I do, it's at the bare minimum. And so we have to remember, what if God (laughs) did that toward us? 
What if God said, Danny, you are so difficult, and I confess I am, you are so difficult, I'm just going to avoid you. Okay? But God doesn't. He doesn't avoid. He moves toward us. And God would call us, all of us willing to follow hard after him, is to do that. And so like, even though we dislike him, that, that's the tension that we feel for the faint-hearted. The tension we may feel is that, man, this is like loving the downer. Like when I, when I spend time with this person, this Eeyore, I just get depressed. I mean, the problems are so overwhelming and they are so unwilling, like they just can't. And it's always, you know, more and more. And I'm here, you know, and so like I'm wanting to be an encouragement, but after a while, it's just, it just feels like a downer. I mean, I just kind of leave depressed. And so that's the tension we feel, but God says, lean into it, learn, learn to love. You know, learn to um, encourage the faint-hearted. And then lastly, you know, for uh, the person who is weak, oftentimes it just feels like a drainer, like to, to love this person. It's draining because I can just spend a lot of time and a lot of effort and so, it, you know, it doesn't take a lot for us to get in touch with why this is difficult. To love difficult people. So what do we do? How do we do this? How do we respond this way? To move toward them, to love them, to care about them. Well, let me uh, kind of finish up with, with uh, four ideas here. Okay, these are four truths that I would suggest to you that help us in loving difficult people. The number one is that uh, love practices tact. Love practices tact. Now this is the idea that, um, that we're mindful of not only what we say, but how we say it. It's very important. Dealing with difficult people, it's not just what you say, but it's how you say it. It also kind of incorporates earlier what I was saying about that you have to discern where someone is and choose a response based on that. You know, responding in a personalized way, but it's also thinking about how you say what you say. Uh, Proverbs 15 gives us a couple of good words here. So chapter 15, verse 1, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Okay, you got, you got someone who's a difficult person. You can respond in kind, but over and over again, as we're going to see in the series, God keeps saying to us, don't return evil for evil. Don't respond in kind. In fact, the wisdom is, is that when you respond with a soft word, quiet word, that oftentimes that can, uh, you know, disengage or diffuse uh, the situation. He says later in the chapter, a hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but uh, he who is slow to anger quiets contention. So there's a way to respond, what I'm calling tact, like how I say what I say. Um, you know, what response I choose. All that's really important. So we need to, um, you know, practice tact. The second thing, which I think is huge here, and the way I word it is this, is that love ponders the tell. That every life has a story. Every life has a tell. Every life, there's something going on. And so when you think of this popular book, How to Hug a Porcupine, you're curious about where the quills came from. Now, the temptation is to care about that, you know, to be curious about that. Like, what happened? And I just think that is a great question for us to ask with people. Now, sometimes you can't just walk up to them and ask them, you know, point blank. But the idea is as you're moving toward them and trying to love them, is that you have this curiosity about, like, what, what's happened in their life. Uh, one person interacting with this book, How to Hug a Porcupine, uh, says this. I, I thought it was worth reading. She says, uh, what do we all desire, parentheses, uh, besides coffee and Netflix, a little humor there. He says, we all want to be loved and accepted. We all want to feel worthy and secure. Porcupines are no exception. 
Don't try to be a psychologist or don't try to be a psychologist. That's not the word. That's not the word that I want here. Maybe it is. I stapled these wrong. I'm sorry. Oh, here it is. You have to turn one page at a time. I know if you've discovered that. Okay, so uh, that's the idea. He says that we all want to feel worthy and secure. Porcupines are no exception. Somewhere along the way, most likely as a result of trauma or heartbreak, survival kicks in and we begin to protect ourselves. Hello, quills. Porcupines in nature use their sharp barbs for protection from predators. I believe after experiencing pain, loss, or betrayal, everyone could be perceived as a threatening predator. Now, I like that because, first of all, it gets us thinking about what, you know, what's happened with the quills here. And like for those of you who say, man, I can be like that. I can be a little edgy. Like I'm a little bit, you know, I keep everybody at a distance. I'm quick to anger. I've got this, you know, rage kind of always on the burner. Uh, so, like, well, what is it? And so, per people that love those kind of people, like, they're curious enough to pursue relationally. Like, kind of, like, tell me a little bit of your story. Like, depending on how much rapport you've established, you might even be able to say something like, like, I don't know if you're aware, but sometimes you come across really kind of, Edgy. You ever heard that before? Can you tell me about that? Now, some of you right now are saying, oh, I'm not a psychologist, Danny. I'm not, I don't know how to dig all that stuff up. Let me tell you, love is being curious. Love is asking questions. I love what uh, Proverbs says again. Let me show you some of these in chapter 15. 13 says, a glad heart makes a cheerful face, but by sorrow of heart, the spirit is crushed. What happened? What happened that crushed your spirit? In chapter 18, verse 14, a man's spirit will endure sickness. Like we, we can endure physically. But a crushed spirit, who can bear? Like those who have really been hurt bad. And then uh, Proverbs tells us the purpose in a man's heart is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. And let me tell you, if you're willing to hear this, are you someone who wants to be the kind of lover, the kind of person who loves difficult, that you're willing to be that person to try to draw out the deep water? Because every person acts in a way on purpose. There's something that they're doing, protecting or promoting, looking for love, looking for security. Like there's all the stuff that we know motivates the human heart. And I just want to encourage you before you dismiss this, to think about this, that God's calling me to love like he does. And part of that is working, moving toward difficult people, trying to find out who they are and what makes them tick. Like what, what causes the quills to surface. That's the idea. Third thing that I want you to consider is this. Is that love points to the truth. Love points to the truth. So sometimes, again, depending on um, what kind of rapport you have, you can give them some feedback. Uh, sometimes I use the analogy I think I got from Crab about, um, you know, people just need someone to hold a mirror up so that someone can see how they're relating. You know, it's, 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 it's pointing to the truth about really how they're responding, but it's also pointing to the truth, that being the word of God. And that in the hope and healing of any of us, what is centered to that is Jesus dying on the cross to pay for our sins, to forgive us, and to free us to live a righteous life. And all of the things that weigh us down producing guilt... And all the things that have happened, like from others toward us, like being able to forgive and live free of that, that's what Jesus does. The Holy Spirit helps us to forgive and to get past those things. And not only just to forgive, but to actually become active in loving people and helping them see like what a re re redemption looks like.
And so it points to truth. It points to the gospel. The fourth thing is that love promotes trust. Love promotes trust. Now here's what I mean on this. Is that you don't want to relate to someone in a way where they become dependent on you. You want to foster in them dependence on God. All right, so we all know kind of the problems of, hey, I can kind of play into this role of helper, of caregiver. And so now, like, any movement in your life is because you've got me there, which can be a real drain when we talk about being a drainer or a downer. Like, when you start letting yourself play that role, that's no longer love. And so this is like one of those things when you hear, like, putting up a boundary, this is a legitimate boundary, is that I don't want, I'm not going to allow uh, me to take the place of God. This person, for their long-term well-being, must learn to trust in God for all that they need to move forward in life. And so we, too, we have to say, okay, in order, like, at some point to entrust them to the Lord, like, I, if I keep giving all my time and energy to this person, because why? I've got to get them changed. It's all up to me. And you start owning a level of responsibility that God doesn't intend for you to own. That's what Paul is saying in Galatians. He says, look, bear each other's burdens, those things that are so big that need help. But everyone learns to carry their own weight. And so sometimes love is saying, okay, I'm pulling back. So that now, you know, you're able to start testing your faith in God. So there's a discernment piece there. That's what I mean about promoting trust. You're promoting trust on them toward God, not on you. And on your end, the trust is that, okay, God, I'm entrusting this person to you. You know, so there, there are some limits with what choices of love I'm going to make here so that I don't fall into that trap. I hope that makes sense to you. I think all, all, all that kind of comes together. So uh, when we think then about, you know, loving difficult people, a big part of it is trying to move toward them, recognizing that the way you respond is going to be diff different for different people. And also just trying to like get a sense of what's going on with them. A story is told of a businessman um, uh, boarding a train uh, on a business trip. It's going to be about a three-hour trip uh, by train. And he gets on and uh, settles into the seat, pulls out the newspaper, starts reading, looking forward to kind of three hours before his next uh, meeting. On board, uh, not far from him, just across the aisle, a couple of seats up, is a young lady who's balancing a, 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 a girl on her knee. The girl's crying. Little girl's crying, and she, uh, she keeps crying. And as the train moves, like, she's, you know, getting to be hysterical. And uh, uh, the lady's trying to calm her down and gets up, tries to walk up and down the aisle, but, you know, kind of goes up and down. And, man, it just, it just, over the period of time, it gets worse. And, and, like, he just can't believe, like, this mother can't take care of her little girl. And he gets angrier, and he gets angrier, and he gets angrier. And he finally, he just says, young lady, can't you take care of that girl, that little girl? And the lady says, I'm sorry, this is not my little girl. I'm not her mother. Her mother's in a coffin in the car behind us. Well, how do you think the man responded then? Nothing but with compassion. Is there something I can do to help? Is, do you need anything? And God says, people that are difficult, you have no idea what's going on. Why don't you be curious? Why don't you move in and think about how to help? That's what love looks like. That's loving difficult people. Father, we pray that you would teach us, make us better, Lord. Father, we confess that at times we're so much more committed to our own comfort and convenience and that loving difficult people we tend to avoid. But God, help us to love like you, Lord. Help us to love people like you loved us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.